Hi, welcome to Jafido International. So today we're going to continue with our 40-day plan, which is something we've been doing now for some time. Now today is day 32 and chapter 32. So as part of our plan, remember we said it's 40 days, we're gradually getting towards the end of this book. And it's such an exciting experience. So we're going to go straight into it because we don't want to waste anybody's time. What's the chapter about? It says, using what God gave you. That's the title of this chapter. So if you're watching us live on Instagram, welcome on board. Feel free to ask us questions. I'm hoping that um, everyone is up to date with the program because we've been away for some time but again not deliberate lots of activities on our part and we just keep coming back when we can so let's start just a quick reminder this is the book we're reading purpose driven life hi everyone i can see all the lovely messages coming through since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. So that's Romans chapter 12, verse 5. And as usual, he normally tells us, gives us some passages to look at <coughs> that will get us started. I'm so sorry I have a cold. So if you hear some croaky voice, please forgive me. It's just the way I am right now. So what you are is God's gift to you. And what you do with yourself is your gift to God. I absolutely love this passage. And this is a Danish proverb. So we get into it. God deserves your best. He shaped you for a purpose and he expects you to make the most of what you have been given. He doesn't want you to worry about or covet abilities you don't have. So abilities you don't have, God doesn't want you to worry about that. Instead, he wants you to focus on talents he has given you to use. And this gave me something to think about. He doesn't want us to worry about abilities that we don't have. Instead, he wants us to focus on talents he's given us to use. And this brings to mind when we take on jobs that we hate. So you take on a job you hate, you're basically trying to force abilities that you don't have. This does not reflect the beauty of God in our lives. It simply spells desperation. It spells, I have no hope and I don't trust what you made me for. But God never makes a mistake. When you attempt to serve God in ways you're not shaped to serve, it feels like forcing a square peg into a round hole. It's frustrating and produces limited results. You also waste your time, your talent and your energy. Usually we, we, we record this for YouTube as well so that you keep having the full book at your own pace whenever you can afford to read them, whenever you have the time to read them. So occasionally we, we take little breaks. Um, on Instagram, usually our battery goes at some point because the program is very long. It takes at least an hour plus. So if you find that it goes off, it doesn't mean we've stopped. It just means we run out of battery. So as usual, go to YouTube and finish listening to it. Thank you so much for everyone that's coming on. So when you attempt to serve God in ways you're not shaped to serve, it feels like forcing a square peg into a round hole. It's frustrating and produces limited results. You also waste your time, your talent and your energy. The best use of your time is to serve God out of your shape. Remember we've talked about shape several times and he's given us the meaning of shape. So the best way to go about this is if you're not sure what shape is, just go back to chapter 31 and chapter 30. We did talk about shape there. 
The best use of your life is to serve God out of your shape. To do this, you must discover your shape. Learn to accept and enjoy it and then develop it to its fullest potential. Now he's explaining what discover your shape means. The Bible says, don't act thoughtlessly, but try to find out and do whatever the Lord wants you to do. Don't let another day go by. Start finding out and clarifying what God intends for you to do. So that's a big message for all of us. We need to start finding out and clarifying what God wants us to do. And he starts to break it down for us. Begin by accessing your gifts and abilities. Take a long, honest look at what you are good at and what you are not good at. That's the big advice. Take a good look at yourself and find out what you are good at and what you are not good at. And Paul advised, try to have a sane estimate of your abilities. Take a very sane estimate of your abilities. Make a list. So sit down, write for yourself things that you are good at, things that you enjoy doing. As other, ask other people for their candid opinion. So it's one thing to also know what you are good at. Is another thing to find out from other people what they think that you are good at. Because sometimes you don't even know what you are good at. When you ask people, they tell you, and when you're asking them, ensure you ask them to give you their candid opinion, not watered, not I want to make you happy, so I'll just say what you want to hear. Tell them you're searching for the truth, not fishing for a compliment, like I just explained. Spiritual gifts and natural abilities are always confirmed by others. Other people around you tend to know what this thing is that you are good at. And sometimes this is what I find with us. Because something comes so naturally to us. Because we are so good at something and we are great at it. We then take it for granted. And we don't know that that's our gift. Because it's just our nature, it's just who we are. We take it for granted. But other people will see it in you. Other people will know that you are so good at this. But you will know because you know you're good at it. And you take it for granted. Oh yeah, but it's you know, only... So it's like people who do braids here and they're good at it. Good. But it's only braids. And I've had occasions where people walk in here and they're so mesmerized by the kind of work I do. And I'm thinking, but it's only braids. Yeah, because I know it. So, ask what happens. If you find, if you ask people who are really close to you, what do you think I am good at? Tell them you want them to be honest with you because you're trying to find out something about yourself. So, if you think you are gifted to be a teacher or a singer and no one else agrees with you, he says, guess what? He doesn't say anymore. He just means, guess what? You're not good at it. If you want to know if you have the gift of leadership, just look over your shoulders. And I think that's a very good message. You think you're a leader, but you look over your shoulders and nobody's following you, guess what? If no one is following, you're not a leader. Ask questions like, so it's giving you the kind of questions you should ask. Where have I seen results? in my life that other people confirmed. So if you were doing something and there are results coming out of it, and then other people are agreeing with you that yes, you're really good at that thing, then that's something to think about. Where have I seen results in my life that other people confirmed? Where have I already been successful? So if there's anything you've been doing and you've been really good at it, then that may be just the thing that you are great at without you knowing. Spiritual gifts test and ability in inventories 
can have some value, but they are limited in their usefulness. So that was a test to see what you are good at, what you've been made for. In the first place, they are standardized, so they don't take into account your uniqueness. So when you do this test, they don't really pull out who you are, that unique person that you are. Second, there are no definitions of the spiritual gifts given in the Bible. So any definition are arbitrary and usually represent a denominational bias. Another problem is that the more mature you become, the more likely you are to manifest the characteristics of a number of the gifts. So the more mature that you become, the more you're going to show a number of the gifts that you have. You may be serving, you may be teaching, or given generously out of maturity rather than because it is your spiritual gift. The best way to discover your gifts and abilities is to experiment with different areas of service. So don't stay stuck in what you do. He wants you to experiment, try different options, try different things, don't stay stuck. The best way to discover your gifts, we just said that one. Just start serving, experimenting with different ministries and then you discover your gifts. So try out something, do it, give it a try. And there, there, there's a saying, you know, very interesting or rather I think, um, it's the national lottery here. They say you have to be in it to win it. So if you don't try something, how do you know if you're not good at it? How do you know if you're good at it? So you have to try it first. Until you're actually involved in serving, you're not going to know what you're good at. You have dozens of hidden abilities and gifts you don't know you've got because you've never tried them out. So he's reminding us that there's so much in us that we don't even know we have. And that's because we've never tried them all. And I remember reading somewhere in the Bible, I think it was Ecclesiastes. He says we, we, we should try up to eight different things at a time because we never know which one God wants us to run with. So that's what he's also trying to tell us here. You will not know until you have tried. You have dozens of hidden abilities and gifts that you don't know you've got because you have never tried them on. Now he's giving us, and I quote, I encourage you to try doing something you've never done before. So he's encouraging us to try doing something we've never done before. No matter how old you are, I urge you to never stop experimenting. He says, I've met many people who discovered hidden talents in their 70s and 80s. I know a woman in her 90s who runs and wins 10K races and didn't discover that she enjoyed running until she was 78 years old. Don't try to figure out your gifts because, before volunteering to serve somewhere. So the message here is, don't sit on your own and start dreaming. I may have been good at this. I could be good at that. I can try this one. I can try that one. No, you have to actually try it out before you can now know if you're good at it or if you're not. Just start serving. That's his message. You discover your gift by getting involved. Try teaching. Try leading. Try organizing. Try playing an instrument. Try working with children or teenagers. He says you will never know what you're good at until you try. When or if it doesn't work out, call it an experiment, not a failure. And this is such a big message that I try to share with even my own children. 
when they try their hands at something and it's not giving them the result they want and they give up and they say they failed it says you haven't failed it says tell yourself it was an experiment you wanted to see if this was going to work or not and I was saying to my daughter the other day it just comes down to the words that we use because the mind tends to pick words in certain ways if you fail the body goes with it it becomes as if you are not good at something and now you are a failure but it says if you try something and it doesn't give you that result you're looking for it is an experiment don't go home crying i failed i tried it it was an experiment and it didn't work out the way i wanted okay time to move on to the next you will eventually learn what you are good at because you're trying different things so it says consider your heart and your personality that's the next point is given us while we're looking at our shape he said paul advised make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given and then sink yourself into that make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given and then sink yourself into that ask yourself questions what do i really enjoy doing most we're still trying to find out our shape what do i really enjoy doing most i'm so sorry my lovely lovely gorgeous people if I'm not responding to your questions, I'm very busy trying to read out what we've written down. But continue asking them. We absolutely appreciate you. When do I feel the most fully alive? That's the question you're asking yourself. Remember, what do I really enjoy doing most? When do I feel the most fully alive? What am I doing when I lose track of time? Because when you're doing something that you really enjoy, you find that time flies by. And that's, that's a clue. That's what he wants you to take on. If you're doing something and time flies by, you really enjoy doing that thing. Do I like routine or do I like variety? So again, that's another question. What kind of personality am I? Do I like routine? Or do I just like different things at a time? Do I prefer serving with a team? Or do I like working by myself? So again, we're still trying to find out your shape. Am I more introverted or extroverted? Am I more of a thinker or a feeler? When do I enjoy more competing or cooperating? So these questions will start giving you answers that are slowly picking out who you really are. So the next one, it says, examine your experiences and extract the lessons you have learned. Review your life and think how it has shaped you. I found this one very, very interesting. He says, look at your life to date. Think about your, your processes in life. Think about the journey you have taken up to this stage of your life. And start asking yourself, how has this journey shaped me? For me, what a journey it has been. It has been a huge journey. I was in Nigeria up to the age of 28 and then I came over here and so I practically like lived nearly half half of my life here in different continents. I can break my life experiences into four major categories that have really shaped my life. As a, as a child, my childhood in Nigeria, 
my adulthood in Nigeria again before marriage and my university life and then my married life my expectations from marriage and how it had varied from my reality of marriage and my life abroad my life living here in England and the experiences that came with it again way below my expectations all the stages of my life have had several consequences of who I have turned out to become and they have shaped the character that I now have and he gives an example he says Moses told the Israelites remember today what you have learned about the Lord through your experiences with him and you remember the story of Moses and the Israelites leaving Egypt and getting to the promised land and on their way and all the experiences they were having and the journey they were going through so all of that experiences Moses reminded them remember your experiences with the Lord forgotten experiences are worthless that's a good reason to keep a spiritual journal Paul worried that the believers in Galatia would waste the pain they had been through and so sometimes when we go through very difficult times and then things get better we tend to forget the pain we've been through but we don't realize that that pain helped to shape the personality we turn out to be. Were all your experiences wasted? He asked them. Were all your experiences wasted? And he said, I hope not. We rarely see God's good purpose in pain or failure or embarrassment while it is happening. So generally when we are going through really difficult times and we are, we are embarrassed, we feel we failed, we don't see God's hand in our lives. We just think, what a mess. We feel disillusioned, we feel broken, we feel lost. When Jesus washed Peter's feet, he said, you do not realize now what I'm doing but later you will understand only in hindsight do we understand how God intended a problem for good I have learned so much through my pains this is me talking now so your pains teach you a lot extracting the lessons from your experience takes time because now we never understand it as it's happening. And so, because it's finished, now to think back and say, what lesson did I learn from this? It takes time for most people. He recommended that you take an entire weekend requiring, he's recommending, Take an entire weekend for a life review retreat where you pause to see how God has walked in the various defining moments of your life and consider how he wants to use those lessons to help others. So generally when we have difficult times and sad things going on in our lives, we think that's the end of the world. But he is reminding us that no, when these things happen, is God using these experiences to prepare us in such a way that we can use our experiences to serve other people, to be there for other people. There are resources that can help us to do this. He's advising. And one of them, again, the next stage, he says, accept and enjoy your shape. Since God knows what's best for us, we should gratefully accept the way he has fashioned us. That's his advice to us. 
Bible says, what right have you, a human being, to cross-examine God? He says the pot has no right to say to the potter, why did you make me this shape? Surely a potter can do what he likes with the clay. So that's us human beings asking God constantly. But why did you create me this way? Why have you brought these problems to me? So we are querying. He says, as a pot, we have no right to query the potter. Why are you creating me this way? Your shape was sovereignly determined by God for his purpose. So you shouldn't resent it or reject it. That's a big message. Instead of trying to reshape yourself to be like someone else, you should celebrate the shape God has given only you. And so, when things start to go wrong in your life and you get all wound up, you are being prepared to help other people in similar scenarios. And while I like to tell everyone that my experience in marriage has been the most difficult for me, it's been the reason I'm reading this book today, to help as many people as possible. It's been the reason I go more and more into personal development, into trying to understand what it's like to live with other people, to understand people around you, to understand what pains are when you're in a relationship with other people, and try to see why things happen the way they do. Because I know for sure I'm not the only woman out there struggling to understand marriage. There are so many women out there going through difficult things in marriage. And I know so many of them. So, how do you help such women? And if I have not experienced the pain of marriage, it will be difficult for me to talk to someone who is going through a difficult time in marriage. And so, again, another example is us black people. It's a great message for us. Because most of the time, we completely want to re-change the way things are with us. Especially us Africans. We don't tend to see the value in who we are and what we have. We're constantly chasing other people's values. We constantly wish we were not in our continent or in our country. We just want to get on the next available plane and disappear from that continent. It's about us learning to accept who we are. Christ has given each of us special abilities, whatever he wants us to have out of his rich storehouse or gates. Part of accepting your shape is recognizing your limitations. Nobody is good at everything, and no one is called to be everything. We all have defined roles. Paul understood that. He understood that was not to accomplish everything or please everyone. He understood that his calling was not to please everyone or accomplish everything but to focus only on the particular ministry God has shaped for him. He said, our goal is to stay within the boundaries of God's plans for us. The word boundaries refers to the fact that God assigned each of us a field or sphere of service. So when God has given you a role to play, take that role on with everything you have. The word boundaries, oh, I just read that one. Your shape determines your specialty. When we try to overextend our ministry reach beyond what God shaped us for, we experience stress. So whenever he's referring to ministry here, he's also referring to our daily life. Whenever we overstretch ourselves, remember we talked about taking on jobs that we hate. We talked about picking out those things that make us who we are. 
So the minute we try to come out of who we are, just that each runner in a race is given a different lane to running. You know, when people are athletics, track race, you're given a track. That's your track, that's your track, that's your track. He says, the way these people are positioned, they are expected to run in their track in their lane we must individually run with patience the particular race that god has set before us so we have been given a race to run in life we should carry on with that race don't be envious of the runner in the next lane to you because you know usually i mean recently I took my son for his school school um, uh, um, athletics. Not just his school, there were several schools where there, and he was given a track, and that was him. He came out first. I was so overjoyed. But what he's saying is, don't be envious of the person in the next track. Because as runners, what they tend to do is, some of them are busy looking left and right to see where the other person is, so maybe that will guide them to run faster. And I remember telling my son when he left home, stay focused on your lane. Don't look back, just stay focused and run. And that was it. He is good at what he does. So he is reminding us here, run your race. Don't be envious of the runner in the next lane to you. Just focus on finishing your race. Now, this being envious happens to all of us. We look at our friends, we say, but she lives in a seven bedroom house. How come I live in a one bedroom house? But she, she does her makeup so well. How come my makeup is so horrible? Look at her fashionable shoes and bags. I don't even have a bag. And so we forget our lane we forget our race in life and we're not thinking about other people you know what happens when you forget who you are and what you're supposed to be doing you get distracted and because you're distracted you're not going to bring out the best of you anymore because you're busy looking at the other person and there's so many sayings that go with that you're putting your eyes in another man's cooking pot. The food is part and dropping your eyes. Anyway, so don't be envious of the runner in the next lane to you because you don't know what God made that person to be. Focus on your race. God wants us to enjoy using the shape he has given us. The Bible says, be sure to do what you should, for then you will enjoy the personal satisfaction of having done your work well. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. So be sure to do your own thing, because you're gonna get satisfaction from it. And then you won't have need to be envious of anyone else. Satan will try to steal the joy of your service from you in a couple of ways. In so many ways, Satan will come and try and take from you that thing that you're good at and distract you, which it does all the time. Um, he says Satan will try to steal the joy of service from you in a couple of ways. <clears throat> By tempting you to compare your ministry with others. So he's tempting you to compare what you are good at with other people. That's a really no-no. By tempting you to conform your ministry to the expectations of others. So what you are good at, he wants you to, to wait and hear what other people expect of you first. Before you now see if you are good at that thing or not. And I gave a good example. We are constantly comparing Africa with the West. I mean, whenever I visit Nigeria and all you hear is, but there's no electricity, 
those of you in the west you have electricity 24 7 there's no water there's no you know so we're constantly back home everyone's constantly wanting to go to the west because there's electricity and there's water and but that's not what it should be we are unique with what we have and it's with that knowledge of what we have that we can create something different that will work for us not by comparing ourselves to become somebody else every country in this world took time to achieve things and it's down to us to put our efforts down to get the same kind of things that we're looking for what are deadly traps that will distract you from serving in the ways God intended whenever you lose your focus in life start by considering if either of these reasons is the cause so ask yourself anytime you lost track in life ask yourself what have i been up to have i been comparing myself with other people have i been waiting for other people to give me go ahead before i can become who i want to be those are the two deadly traps that satan is very good at pushing us to The Bible warns us never to compare ourselves with others. Do your own work well and then your will. And then you will have something to be proud of. But don't compare yourself with others. That's a clear message from the Bible. And I'm hoping I'm speaking to someone out there. I'm really hoping I'm speaking to someone. Because this message is to you do your own work well and then you will have something to be proud of don't compare yourself with others there are two reasons why you should never compare your your, your ministry or the results of your ministry with anyone else first you will always be able to find someone who seems to be doing a better job than you and you will then become discouraged. So whenever you try to compare yourself with others, there will always be someone you think, oh, but that person is doing a better job than me. So who am I then? And the minute you do that, you start getting discouraged. Now you're losing focus. Second, you will always find someone who doesn't seem as effective as you and you would then get full of pride so the second one is you've seen someone who's less than you this person is not achieving as much as you are suddenly you feel oh my goodness i'm a lot better than that person i'm great what's happening the scene of pride comes in either attitude will take you out of service and rob you of your joy so either of this attitude would distract you take you away from why and what you should be doing paul said it is foolish to compare ourselves with others he said we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some uh, with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves they are not wise the message para paraphrase says, in all this comparing and grading and competing, they quite miss the point. They miss the point of life. You will find that people who do not understand your shape for ministry will criticize you and try to get you to conform to what they think you should be doing. He says you should ignore them. Paul often had to deal with critics who misunderstood and maligned his service. His response was always the same. Avoid comparison, resist exaggerations, and seek only God's commendation. One of the reasons Paul was used to greatly by, was used so greatly by God was that he refused to be distracted by criticism or by comparing him, his ministry with others or by being drawn into 
fruitless debates about his ministry. And I just reminded myself, I need to learn from this. This happens all the time. You get people who just want to sit there and criticize everything you do. But why have you not done it this way? You should have done it that way. Why did this happen that way? Why are you doing... And this is just constant and constant and constant. But you see, books like this remind you that, you know, stick to what you are good at. Stick to what gives you joy. Stick to what makes you happy. Continue to be yourself. The minute you start stopping and listening to all this noise all around, all around you, you lose it. You get distracted. As John Bonyan said, if my life is fruitless, it doesn't matter who praises me. If my life is fruitless, it doesn't matter who praises me. It doesn't matter. Um, and if my life is fruitful, it doesn't matter who criticizes me. And that's a big message. If his life is fruitless, it doesn't matter who's praising him because it's fruitless anyway. So your praise will not do anything for him. But if his life is fruitful, it doesn't matter who's criticizing him because he's already full of what he thinks he should be achieving. It's a big message we should all take on. Focus on achieving what you're here for. Your life is not dependent on people. You are here for God's purpose. And the next stage he says, keep developing your shape. Jesus' parable of the talent illustrates that God expects us to make the most of what he gives us. We are to cultivate our gifts and abilities, keep our hearts aflame, grow our character and personality and broaden our experiences in life so we will be increasingly more effective in, in our service. So culti cultivate our gifts. So whatever these gifts are that God has given us, work on it, improve on it. That's the message. Cultivate your gifts and abilities. Keep your hearts aflame. Get excited. Grow your character. Be more useful. Be more fruitful around yourself. And broaden your experiences of life. Remember he said just keep trying different things. That's broadening your experiences. Open it up. Try things. Learn something new. Be excited about life. Because when we do that, we get increase, we increase and we become more effective in life. Paul told the Philippians to keep on growing in your knowledge and understanding. And that's a big message to all of us. Keep on growing in your knowledge and understanding. And that's one of the biggest things that I try to teach all the time. Solomon said it, above all things gain understanding, above all things gain knowledge. You cannot become anything if you don't have knowledge. In any field you go into, gain understanding. And here he's telling us we must broaden it, we must continue to grow. To become effective in life, we have to grow our character and our personality by broadening our experiences and our knowledge. To grow mentally and wiser in life, you have to feed your life with knowledge. You cannot... <coughs> Pardon me. You cannot sit in your house and not do anything with yourself and not add on any knowledge and then you expect yourself to grow. You're not going to grow. You will remain stagnant. Just as you feed your stomach with food, 
Because I know some of us who go out there, we get into the mall, we buy everything there is in the shop and fill that trolley and push it. We feed our stomach constantly. But when it comes to putting knowledge, putting food into our knowledge, into our brain, we struggle. One way of growing your knowledge, of broadening your knowledge, is to watch videos like this. Personal development, that's what they're called. Adding knowledge to yourself. And Paul reminded Timothy, Kindle afresh the gifts of God which is in you. Kindle afresh means keep it going fresh. Update your knowledge. I mean, I know so many people who all they want to do is stagnate. They remain in centuries past. I know so many people who don't want to know anything about the internet. They don't want to know anything about social media. They've never heard of email. And they tell you they want to grow. How can you possibly grow if you don't keep yourself updated with what is happening in life? That's what Paul meant here. Kindle afresh the gifts of God which is in you. So everything God has made you for, keep it afresh. If you don't exercise your muscles, the weaken. And, uh, and develop atrophy. In the same way, if you don't utilize the abilities and skills of God that he has given to you, you will lose it. Skills, you will lose it. Just the same way, if you don't exercise your muscle, they become stiff. That's what it means. Your muscle will become stiff if you don't walk around, run around, take a little jog, go to the gym, do some exercise, do something with your body. If you don't do that, you become stiff. If you don't put knowledge in yourself, you will lose it. Jesus taught the parable of the talent to emphasize the truth. And take your time, go and read that parable again. These three people were given money to go. The master gave them money and travel. And the three of them, one dug the soil and put his own money in there. And the other two used the money to do business. And then they made more money out of They made so much profit. He said, referring to the servant who failed to use his one talent, the one who dug the ground and put the money in. The master said, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. That's what the message is. Because when God gives you skills and knowledge and abilities and you don't use it, it takes it away from you. And then the person who even has more will get more because then that person takes it from you. And this message hit home with me. I mean, I've read that parable of the talent over and over and I've not seen it the way he explained it here. I mean, look at us in Africa. We have so much, so much natural resources everywhere. But what do we do? We don't use it. So do you know what's going on now? Other continents are coming over to take what we have. Do you see how that works with the Bible? The one who did not use his talent and he dug the ground and put it in, the master said, take it from him and give it to the one who has. So we sit back there and we mourn and complain because as Africans, we don't want to sit down and take on our job of developing the things that God gave us. So what's going on? People who are coming from other parts of the world who have enough. They have enough. They come to us in Africa and then they take, they rip. They steal, they grab everything we have and take it away with them. So that servant who dug the ground and put his own talent and did not use it, that's us Africans. We dug the ground, we put all our talents because we have been messed around. We're not thinking. 
And that's the same to you and me. If you have talent, if you have skills, if you have knowledge, if you have experience, and you should be using it to better your life, but you choose not to use it, it will be taken away from you. Your knowledge will be taken away from you. Your skills will be taken away from you. And then you'll be sitting down there and people who have will be getting more and more knowledge, more and more skills, more and more talents because you have chosen not to use yours. Fail to use what you've been given and you will use it. You will lose it. That's a big message. Fail to use what you've been given. And use the ability you've got and God will increase it. And this is so true. Again, it, it reflected with me. Because whenever I have knowledge, whenever I have information, whenever I have skills, I come here and I sit with you and I share it with you. But guess what? I'm constantly being blessed with more knowledge. I'm constantly being blessed with more information. So once you use what you have, more comes in. That's a big message. If you use it, you get more. You don't use it, it sits down there and you lose it. That's a big message you have to take on today. Fail to use what you've been given and you will lose it. Use what you've been given and it will be increased. God will increase it for you. So big message, go out there, research, ask questions, be curious, improve on whatever it is you know you enjoy doing. Whatever you like doing, do it. Anything you have, a little inclination that you might like this, go and try it out. And if it doesn't work, call it an experiment. It didn't work, I will try another. Never give up hope. Never give up hope. Paul told Timothy, be sure to use the abilities God has given you. Put these abilities to work. Put all your abilities to work. That's the big message I'm going to give to you today. Put anything you think you can do to work. Because if you don't use it, we've been told by every point clearly, we will lose it. And go back and read up on that parable of the talent. He has made it so clear. Whatever gifts you have been given <clears throat> can be enlarged through practice. So that's a bigger message too. Because the more you use it, the better you will get. Look at with our home training pack. This is all about braiding and weaving and adding extensions. Home pack. All the knowledge you can think of in braiding is there. And then we get people who want to come and train and then the first day they think, no, I can't deal with it. It's too hard. But like he said here, whatever gifts you have been given can be enlarged through practice. The more you do it, the better you're going to get. For instance, no one gets the gift of teaching fully developed. So you don't walk into a class and overnight you're the best teacher. But we study, feedback and practice, a good teacher can become a better teacher. And with time, grow to become a master teacher. Don't settle for a half-developed gift. Stretch yourself and learn all you can. You have to stretch yourself and learn all you can about any ability that you're thinking you want to take on. Concentrate on doing your best for God. Walk for God's work. You won't be ashamed of it. 
Take advantage of every training opportunity to develop your shape. Take advantage. Look at such great advice. Take advantage of every training opportunity to develop your shape and sharpen your seven skills. Take advantage of every training opportunity. This is a training opportunity that can make you as great as possible in hair. Use it. Every training opportunity. If it was uh, 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 hospitality and care you were thinking of. If it was baking cake you were thinking of. If it was becoming a fashion designer you were thinking of. If it was becoming a photographer you were thinking of. If it was becoming a videographer, a filmmaker, a singer, a musician, or a footballer, um, a sprinter. I take my son for practice every Monday. You have to develop it. It says, stretch yourself. Stretch yourself and learn all you can so that you become the best in that field. Take advantage of every training opportunity to develop your shape and sharpen your service skills. So once you have trained and trained and trained because you are good at this naturally, everything will come together. In heaven, we are going to serve God forever. But right now, we can prepare for the external service by practicing on earth. And like athletes training for Olympics, we keep training for that big day. So we have to keep training. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. But we are after one gold medal for eternity. We're getting ready for eternal responsibilities. On this. And so this is where this ends today. What an amazing chapter this has been. But of course, if you've got a message out of this, remember to like this channel. Remember to share it this message to people remember to subscribe so you get to know more because we still are chapter 32 there's still seven more chapters to go or eight more chapters but before we go we always have the final points to note the first point is God deserves the best he deserves my best that's the point God deserves my best God deserves your best. And the verse to remember, it says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So you are a workman. You do not, you do not need to be ashamed of your work. And you correctly handle the word of and this was 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And the question we have to consider is, how can I make the best of what? So that the people who don't use theirs, God will actually say, let me take it away from them and give me. Because they are not using it. So you are using yours. You are now the person who is making God proud. Because he gave you those talents for a reason. He didn't give it to you to go and dig the ground and put it in. He gave it to you to use it to serve him. And by serving him, you're working with other people. You're bringing light to the world. That's what those gifts were for. That's what your talents are for. So you want to ask yourself, how can I make the best of what God has given me? Ask yourself that every day. And the answers will come. So thank you so much, and we'll see you in the next chapter. God bless you, Italy.